Welcome to Giving an Answer, the show dedicated to defending the historic Christian faith. I am your host, Harold Felder, and I have a very special guest with me. Now, a lot of times when you watch my show, we're talking about all these, you know, abstract concepts. We're talking about God. We're talking about, you know, things about this and that, things that are, that are factual, that sort of remove from people in general. But today we're going to talk about uh, Derwin Gray's transformation. He actually is going to give us an, another look at, at some of this stuff. He's going to actually, we're actually going to be able to see the power of Christ in someone's life. I mean, we, we use apologetics to try to bring people to Christ, but we're actually going to see what Christ does in someone's life. And let me just tell you a little bit about Derwin, just a little bit. Derwin has an undergraduate in sports business management. He's also a student at Southern Evangelical Seminary, and he's pursuing a Master's of Divinity in Apologetics. The former NFL player, he's going to tell you more about that. And he also the co-host of two sports shows. You have two sports shows? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Got Game and Panthers Unleashed. And, and they both on Fox News here in uh, Charlotte. And him and his wife, they've co-founded a, a ministry called One Heart at a Time. Could you tell us a little bit about the One Heart at a Time ministry? Yeah. Uh, first of all, Harold, thank you so much for having me on your show. Uh, it's great to see one of my seminary colleagues using their gifts and abilities. So I appreciate that. And I'm humbled to be on your show. Um, One Heart of Time Ministries was started in 1999. My uh, wife and I had just become Christians, and um, we just had a burden and a passion to touch people's lives. They were wounded and broken like our, like our lives. Uh, right. Jesus came in and done a great work in our heart, and the joy of our life was to give that away. Now, we had no clue what we were doing. We still don't know what we're, we're doing. Our message is, is for God to love the world, that he wants to transform you personally so that you too can transform the world. And my wife and I said, well, what are we going to call this ministry? And the first thing out of my mouth was one heart at a time. Because when you read about the life of Christ, he impacted one heart at a time, whether if they were a prostitute, a leper, or someone high up in uh, the Roman government. He yeah. touched one heart at a time. And I've seen you speak. Uh, and, and, and you definitely have an evangelist heart, and you definitely, you stress the love of Christ. I mean, sometimes, I mean, like I said, I'm an apologist, and you're an apologist, but sometimes we get caught up. <laughs> we get caught up in the facts. We get caught up in the evidence. And we forgot that they're, we, sometimes we forget that they're real people. And, uh, and every time I hear you talk about, you know, Christ and about his love, you know, it, it wakes me up. It makes me say, Okay, that's what it's really about. And uh, as a matter of fact, you're going to be speaking uh, at a conference. And actually, I'm going to be speaking at the same conference you're going to be speaking in, at, in California. So I'm going to have the, the privilege of actually being on the same stage as you. But uh, like I said, once again, it's, it's a very, very good honor to have you here. And you sort of keep me grounded. Because like I said, I, get, I, get, I can get a little away from the, from the, uh, from the main thing sometimes. Because what apolog apologetics is designed to do is to bring people into that relationship. And sometimes I lose sight of that. You know, but through your story today, we're going to learn that that's that is what it's all about. So, lead us into your testimony. Well, basically, uh, you know, I, being an NFL player, some, some sometimes people will put put you up on a on a platform, and I'm here to say to to you and to everybody, the Psalms 8:5 says that God has made humanity and has crowned them with glory and honor. So each person is valuable and worthy of dignity. And so whether if you played in the NFL or whatever you do, you're valuable to God, and your life matters to God. And my life is an example of that. Uh, I grew up in the ghetto of San Antonio on the west side. My crib was toe up from the flow up. Translation for the audience, that means it was raggedy. And, and so growing up in my hood, the only way out was football. So in my life, I bought the American dream that if I could have an NFL career and succeed and get money and give money to my family, that my life would be transformed and changed. Right. Now what happened was, is I was transformed, but not in the way that I truly needed to be transformed. My ghetto moved from the ghetto of my environment to the ghetto of my soul. In other words, materialism became my ghetto. So whether if I was in a physical ghetto or a materialistic ghetto, the results was the same. When I looked in the mirror, I seen an empty, selfish, pathetic, scared little boy with no purpose, no future. So when the cheering stopped and the plan stopped, I had to come face to face with the man in the mirror and what I seen I didn't like. Now, God in his sovereignty, meaning that he's in control of things, uh, blessed me to play for the Colts. In 1993, I was drafted. And the Colts had a player on the team named Steve Grant, but he had a nickname. 
His nickname was the Naked Preacher. Now, he got that nickname because every day after practice, he would take a shower, dry off, and wrap a towel around his waist. Imagine this. African-American, 6'2", 240 pounds, with gold fronts, walking around the locker room going, do you know Jesus? He literally would walk around the locker room and share Jesus. What was amazing is everyone respected him because his life was authentic, not perfect, but authentic. They seen that he really believed what he said. They seen that Jesus was a treasure of his life, the way he played the game, the way he interacted with fans and the way he interacted with guys in the locker room. So one day my rookie year, he asked me, do you know Jesus? And I explained to him that I'm a good person. I'm the only male in my family over 20 not to have a drug problem. Only male in my family over 20 to graduate high school, let alone college. Only male in my family over 20, you know, to not have a child outside of marriage. So therefore, I thought I was a good person. Right. But then he'd done something that changed my worldview. He opened his Bible and he showed me Romans 3, 23 that says, we've all sinned and fall short of God's standard. Well, what is God's standard for us? Well, Jesus said it in Matthew 5, 4, 8. He said, be perfect as your father in heaven is. Well, I know I'm not perfect in any way. So the wheels begin to spin. I, and I said, naked man, what am I supposed to do to be perfect? I can't do anything. I've blown it. He says, now you're starting to get it. And he explained to me, Jesus died for your sins. He rose again on the third day, not just to go to, to heaven, but to live his life through you and to fill your life with his love, purpose, and me me meaning. Now, this is a five-year process of him chasing me around the locker room naked. Now, when you say a five-year process, what do you mean? Do you mean the first time he came to you, you just rebuffed him or? Oh yeah, absolutely. I didn't, I didn't have time for, for that. You know, when things are going well, we don't have time right. for God. Right. But towards the end of my career, I started getting injuries. And when I was flat on my back, I began to hear the voice of God in August 2nd, 1997. Uh, by the way, the voice that was always there that I didn't want to hear, but now I had ears to hear because I was laying flat on my, my back. August 2nd, 1997, my fifth year in the NFL with the Colts, uh, it was right after lunch, it was training camp, and I called my wife and I, I said, honey, I want to be more committed to you and more committed to Christ. And at that moment, something happened. I was radically transformed and changed. I had never read a book from front to back and I began to devour books. I began to devour the Bible and I began to share Christ. It was just overflowed out of me. I wanted to share this marvelous light that I had found. Now, what you got to understand is I didn't come from a quote unquote overly religious home. We were Jehovah's Witness by name. So what I grew up with was, you know, Jesus isn't God. You never go to church. But yet in our home, that was, no, that was not lived. And then I got a football scholarship to Brigham Young. Now imagine this, I'm from the ghetto, Latinos, African-Americans, some right. Caucasians. Then I, I go to BYU in the mountains in Utah where everybody's Mormon and white. And so it was like a culture shock, but it was great though because God taught me how to get along in diversity. Right. And also now that I am a follower of Christ, it gives me the capacity to share the historic Jesus with people who are Jehovah's Witnesses or people who are Mormon. And I have uh, family that are Mormon, I have friends that are Mormon, and the one thing that they know about me right off the bat is whether if you agree with me or not, I'm going to love you because you're a creation of God, because right. He's crowned you right. with honor, He's crowned you with dignity, so therefore I I'm going to respect you, but I'm going to passionately share Christ with you. Not just any Christ, but the historic Christ of the Bible. Because as the Bible says, there's different Jesuses, there's different Gospels. And so what I've learned over the years and how to, and how to engage them is from the aspect of love and asking questions, just as Jesus did. Now, one of the things I do want to mention, and you made this point very, very well, is that sometimes we get caught up and we look at people with as objects. We look at people as something to be saved. We look at them as a goal, almost like a notch in a belt. But one of the things that comes across clearly when you speak, comes across clearly when you preach, is you do not objectify people like that. No. You look at people as being made in the image of God, and by that fact alone, they are worthy. Absolutely, and I think that's the power of understanding Christian theology because you're made in the image of God. That doesn't mean you have that he, God has a physical body. It means you have the capacity for love, for truth, for righteousness, for beauty. So therefore, every person matters to God and their life is valuable. Imagine what would happen if we began to treat people 
that way. Imagine if our heart would break the way God's heart breaks when there's injustice. The most precious commodity on earth are human beings. And as an evangelical Christian, it is my passion. It is the joy that overflows out of my heart to reach people, to hold people who are unholdable, to love pe people who are unlovable, to touch those who have broken hearts. And that's the story of Christ. Yeah. God in human flesh, he incarnated and moved amongst us to share his life. Basically, what I want to do is share the life that has found me in Christ so that you can participate of it as well. Now, one of the things that, that you talked about is love. And Jesus was very clear that the reason, the way people would know us is by our love for one another. And one of the reasons why I think that a lot of other religious organizations, a lot of cults have been successful within the Christian community is because they will show them love. Now, I remember I had an instance where I had, uh, I had some women come to my door and they were, you know, talking to me. They were, you know, sharing their faith with me. And one of the things that did come across is that they seemed sincere. I mean, the guy was like, look, he said, look, he said, okay, I see you're not open to this. He said, but look, if you're ever moving, here's my number, give me a call. I mean, he seemed genuinely interested. So a lot of people are leaving the churches or are being more susceptible to, to other influences because they do not see the love. They do not see the love that's in the church. And, and if the church loves one another as they are supposed to love one another, then I think that a lot of the problems that we have in the church would just completely vanish. Well, what you've just communicated is, uh, is one of my passions. J Jesus said in John 13, 34, he says, a new commandment I give you to love one another as I have loved you. They will know that you're my disciples, my right. students, my learners, if you have love for one another. However, this love is not self-generated. It is son generated. In other words, the closer you are to Jesus, the more his passions become your passions. And when your passions are his, your first passion is going to be loving your fellow brother and sister in Christ and then moving that outward to those who are outside of the faith. So number one, in order to love passionately, we've got to be in love with the one who is the great passionate lover of our souls, Christ. And so it is a son generated type of love. Within the body of Christ, there is much diversity that is beautiful. However, a lot of times we use that diversity to argue. Now, as a theologian, as a philosopher, as an apologist, I've got some firm convictions, but I've got to keep the main things, the main things. As right, long as we right. keep the main essential doctrines as unifying, we can have that type of all encompassing love that the world looks and goes, man, you people really genuinely love each other. Now in America, there's a lot of, uh, as Christians, we are the majority for the most part. And when you're the majority, you get lazy. Yeah. And a lot of times persecution spurs us on to that type of love. And uh, when you look in Latin America and in China, the church is growing and booming and exploding. Why? Because in the early church, first century, what made the church grow is that when prostitutes were abandoning their children, Christians were bringing them in. Yeah. You know, when, when, uh, when people were dying, Christians were burying them. When Christians were being persecuted, they would run to the lions to die because they knew to live is Christ and to die is gain. Yeah. So they were really passionate. They really treasured and valued Jesus and it came out in their lives. So the thing is, love isn't something you go, oh, I want to love more. Love is something that says, God, you love me so that I can be an extension of your love. Now, one thing you mentioned before, you were saying that when the naked preacher first started, you know, <laughs> Uh, pursuing you that you weren't interested and 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 you mentioned that once injury, injury started getting to you that you started being more receptive now how would you respond to someone who said well then you were just using the gospel message as a crutch I would say that is not true because God is not a crutch he's not my crutch he's my life support system okay he's more than a crutch right he is my life support system and I am hooked up matter of fact John chapter 1 verse 4 says that in him was the light and life of men so he is my very life, not just a crutch. He's not my co-pilot. He's the pilot. He is my life, Colossians 3.3. 3. So I would agree with them. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, here's the key, though. For the person who says, well, God is just a crutch, is not their car their crutch? Is not their job their crutch? You see, we all have types of crutches and support systems. The question is, which one is dependable and reliable?
that's the question. Yeah, because a lot of times we, and, 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 and you make very good sense, because what you're talking about is actually what, what happens to people in general. When g things are going good, we don't even listen for God. I mean, we, God is just over there somewhere. But it's only when we're feeling pain, it's only when we're struggling that we even look out for God. Look at 9-11. Look how many churches were filled after 9-11. Because people say, well, you know, there is something more. You know, when people were feeling pain, people were hurting, then they started looking for God. You know, unfortunately, people sometimes, a lot of times, only look for God when they're in pain or when they're in hurting. And that's a shame because they're looking at God as some kind of a spare tire when God is the sustainer of us. But sometimes we, what did C.S. Lewis say? I, I can't remember his exact. He, he said that God shouts at us in a megaphone through pain. Right. And uh, King David said in Psalms 119 verse 71, he said, it was good that I was afflicted that I may learn thy ways. And God's rival is us trying to be our own gods. And when we realize our utter helplessness, that's when we truly begin to seek after him. And so I think that suffering and pain is a way in which God brings us to himself. And what's beautiful about the God of Christianity is he incarnated. That means to put on flesh and he entered into our pain and our suffering. He knows how a tsunami victim feels. He knows how a cancer patient feels. He knows how people who've been destroyed by war feels because all the sins of the world were put upon him and yeah. he felt that pain. Yeah. And what's beautiful is that he gives us victory over that pain because three days later, he rose from the dead. I heard uh, Dr. Habermas, one of the professors at Southern Evangelical Seminary, was he made this very good point. He was talking about, uh, I think he wrote a book about pain. And uh, one of the things he said was that, particularly when we lose a loved one, we say, well, where was God in that? And what we fail to see is that that person belonged to God first. You know, and if God would give up his only son, I mean, that, God feels the pain too. We look at God as just some guy way out there who's sort of untouched, sort of indifferent. But no, like you were saying, he's feeling our pain. Mm -hmm. You know, every every one of us who has a loved one died. That was that was God's creation. God felt that pain. And when Christ, son, when when uh, Jesus, when Jesus was on the cross, God's own son, he felt that pain too. It wasn't like he was he's indifferent. He's not. He's anything but indifferent. If he was indifferent, there would be no Christ upon the cross. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Uh, and the question I pro I propose to you, myself, and our audience is, how would you live if you knew you were dying? How would you treat those around you if you knew you were dying? How would you worship God if you knew you were dying? Well, we are all dying, some sooner than others. So let's get busy living. And the only way we have true life is G Jesus says the still, the enemy comes to still kill and destroy, but I come to give life and life to its full. And so that's beautiful about our God is he's not distinct or remote. He entered into our pain and he got his hands dirty. He got snot on his nose and threw it off and said, I'm going to the cross and I'm going to resurrect to give you power and hope. Our world needs hope. And Jesus is the great hope of the world. And for those of us who follow Christ, Colossians 1:27 says that Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, okay, let's get back to the, the naked preacher. All right, now, he's chasing you for five <laughs> years. Now, what's happening? I mean, what's happening over these five years? Well, right? yeah, I'm, well basically, I'm gaining success in the NFL. I've become a two-time Pro Bowl nominee. Uh, I've got a beautiful wife. We got married in college. Uh, I've, I've, I've got a daughter. Uh, my investment portfolio is growing. I'm able to buy my family cars. I'm able to do things I've always wanted to do it, go to nice restaurants. People want my autograph. I am living the American dream but it turns out to be a nightmare because I'm empty. And so as he's chasing me around the locker room, my God begins to fail me. And you know what my- mm, Your God, your, your, your wealth, your- Well, even deeper than that, my true God was me. Five oh, foot 11, okay. 205, 4440, 38 inch vertical leap. Okay. And all of a sudden, my God, me, starts to get injured. And my God begins to let me down. And as a man, my identity was wrapped up in what I did. So if I lost my football job, who would I be then? See, I didn't understand that I was made in God's image and I'm valuable, not because of what I do, but because he made me. Right. Who would I be then if I lost my job? I'd be a no one. And so I lived in fear of losing my job because I would lose myself. But as I began to experience injuries, the voice of God 
began to call me and I'd begin to read my Bible. At first it was like reading somebody else's, someone else's mail, but I'd read it on the plane and I'd start reading and I'd start listening to the naked man and I wouldn't let him know it, but I was watching his life and then God would bring other Christians around the team. And by the way, I gave them a hard time. I'd make fun of them when they were reading their Bibles. Mm. But these same men that I would make fun of were the same men that would surround me and answer my questions and help me. That's, yeah, that's, that's very powerful. So he's chasing you around and you're starting to see the light. But what, what did it for you? What eventually made you make that commitment? Well, the only thing that I can look to is, um, like I said, August 2nd, 1997, in a small dorm room, Anderson, Indiana, my fifth year with the Colts, in training camp. You know, you're away from your wife and your kids. It was right after lunch. And uh, I guess God and His Spirit have just been working on, on my heart, moving, just giving me more light as I responded, just moving my heart. And I called my wife and I said, I want to be more committed to you and I want to be more committed to Christ. And at that moment, I literally felt my soul move Godward. And I wasn't the same. I was not the same. I went from self-centeredness to God-centeredness and a desire to embrace and love those around me. Now, don't, get, don't get, get, get me wrong by any stretch of the imagination. I walked and I stumbled just as I do now. Being a Christian doesn't mean uh, I'm without sin. It means I'm authentic and I treasure Christ above all, that he's the joy of my life. And for those of us who are watching, maybe you may not have had a conversion experience, but you know Christ, that's okay. Maybe you may not have a testimony like mine, but God has given them a testimony to testify, to speak of the goodness that he's done in their lives. You know, as Christians, we should have the most joy in the world. Yeah. Uh, our lives shouldn't be wasted because we've been impregnated with the very life of God himself to impact history, to change our families, to fight social injustice, and to live lives that reflect Jesus. That's where joy is, that's where passion is, that's where excitement is. People ask me all the time, do you miss playing in the NFL? And I say, nope. They say, why? I say, because every day in Christ, whether if I'm at the coffee shop, whether if I'm playing with my kids or talking to my wife on a date, no matter what I'm doing, it's an opportunity to worship God. I was fishing the other day in Florida. I was speaking at the University of Fl Florida. I had a day off, so I went to fish, and I caught fish, and some of the college students and high school kids were around me. So I was looking at the fish and looking at the design and, be and beauty, saying, you know what? We can glorify and worship God because of His creation in all things when we fish. We don't have to pray just when we eat. When we go to Carowinds, we can worship and thank God. You see, our joy, our portion is Him, being satisfied in him. So then your fear was gone. Uh, I wouldn't, on one level it was gone, but I would be lying if I didn't say I don't have fear. Last May, my wife was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Of course I have fear. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and by the way, she's doing great. We've That's gone good. through the treatments, but God even used that suffering to identify with us and to encourage us and strengthen us. But yes, there's fear. I mean, we wouldn't be human if we didn't have fear. But however, Jesus said this in John 16, 33. He says, in this world, you will have troubles. But then he says, take courage, for I have overcome this world. So I have to give my fear to Christ. I have to say, Jesus, I'm needy. Now, for a man to say that is pretty radical, but for all of us, we're needy. Right. God, I'm needy of you. I've got fear. But since you've overcome the world and since you're my God, my friend, my source of life, I give that fear to you. So how did your football career end? How did that? Well, my football career ended in 1998. The last game I played in was in Texas Stadium against the Dallas Cowboys. And I was running down. I hope y'all beat them. Uh, actually, uh, we didn't. Oh, okay. But I have beaten the Dallas Cowboys. Now, growing, okay, up, now, now growing up in Texas, you was a Cowboy fan. So I was a Cowboy fan. I'm from D.C. And I know, and, 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 and God will forgive you. His <laughs> grace is good enough to forgive a red skin. <laughs> His grace is sufficient. His huh? grace is sufficient. <laughs> so I didn't like Joe Theismann, oh, Dexter man. Manley. Oh, now, I like Daryl Green, though. Yeah. I yeah. like my man. I like Riggins back in the day. Yeah, he used yeah. to hurt me. Yeah. Oh, they used to hurt. I actually had very... Uh, uh, of many conversations with Joe Theismann when he come to our games and stuff. So okay. it, it, it's cool. But so I'm playing against the Cowboys. I run downfield and I'm doing something I do a, a hundred times. I'm just blocking the, off a guy and he goes one way. I go the other way. And then all of a sudden I hear ligaments snap and bones break. And I know I'm hurt bad. So I'm laying down in Texas Stadium. Now, Texas Stadium has a big hole in the roof. You know why, right? 
Because God, yeah. Because so God, God can look just, down and see, see his, his favorite, favorite team. team. I yeah. think I heard that from you. Yeah, but I didn't like the Cowboys at the time anyway, so we'll throw that joke out. Okay. So anyway, right. I'm laying down, I'm hurt, right? And I just become a Christian. I'm like, okay, God, I know I'm hurt bad. I heard bones break. I'm in intense pain, but I trust you. I'm not going to pray for a day, but I trust you. As a result of that injury and some previous ones, it began to move my passions onto something else. As a result of that injury now, I've gotten to share the gospel, the great news of God's great love and power for humanity to over 40 million people via TV. 40 million? 40 million. TV, radio, uh, speaking engagements. I believe God has allowed me to play football to have a platform for what I'm doing now because the NFL opens the door. Now, you know what the NFL stands for. It stands for not for long. So God gave me that not for long career to give me this career. Now, you can be in the NFL and worship and, and any occupation you have, you can glorify God. But for me personally, it was my calling to play for six years and then to move on. Uh, now, this is between just you and the audience and my, myself. I got cut from Pee Wee League football. At eight years old, I got cut from the team. Have you ever heard anybody getting cut from Pee Wee League? You know how bad you got to be? I don't think I got cut from Pee Wee. You, you know how bad you got to be to get cut from Pee Wee League? That's like not being able to chew uh, uh, bubble gum and walk. <laughs> right. And so for me to make it to the NFL after getting cut from Pee Wee League is astonishing. And I see the providential hand of God saying, I'm going to allow you to play. You're going to work hard. You're going to sweat. You're going to bleed. You're going to pay for it. But I'm going to give you this platform so that now you can go as my ambassador to make an impact in this world. And every believer has that platform, whether if you're at home with your children, whether if you're on the Harold Felder show, no matter what your platform is, God has given it to you to impact history, yes. which is his story. There's a big story. God is the star. And there are sub stories that you and I play a little part in. That. Now, this has been a great show, but we've just scratched the surface. So we're going to have actually come back. I'm going to ask you to come back and we can do this again and, and pick up right where we left off at. Is Thank that you. is that right with you? That'll work. Okay, then that's going to bring us to a close for this show. Uh, if you have any questions about Christianity, about the show, about how you can better defend your faith, give me a call. Write me an email. Until then, I'll see you next week. Goodbye and God bless.